Back in the day, meaning both antiquity and the Middle Ages, traveling was difficult, dangerous and took a very long time. Consequently, few people managed to explore distant regions and the tales they brought back, which were relatively inaccurate to begin with, were heavily distorted by the retellings, giving birth to outlandish creatures, among others. A phenomenon we've dealt with a couple of times in this series, and the Crocotta and Lucrata are no different. You might have heard of these monsters already, as they are not that obscure. Or you might know them by a different name, like Crocotta, Crocuta, Crocot, Curcrocute, Sinolicus, Kinodicus, Lucrocotta, Lucrota, Leocrota, or any of these with a different permutation of O's and T's. That's a lot of alternative names for two creatures, you might be thinking, and you would be right. Practically every author uses a different name, so for the sake of simplicity, I will use the Crocotta and Lucrata versions instead of their specific flavor. Still, that's two names, presumably belonging to two distinct creatures. So what is the difference between a Crocotta and a Lucrata? The short answer is, I don't know. At least that's what I would have said after my initial research. Now that I have meticulously gone through a few dozen primary and secondary sources, I can give a much more informed answer about two things. Most of the features that would make them unique are mixed up from source to source, both of them sharing the majority of their traits across the various accounts. Still, let me describe both and you can count the differences in the meantime. The Crocotta is the more commonly referenced creature, therefore the one with the more expensive lore. Ctesias's Indica is among the first books to mention this creature to European audiences. He calls the animal a dog wolf noting that they live in Ethiopia and wield amazing strength. As brave as a lion, as swift as a horse and as strong as a bull. What is truly unique about the beast is that it can mimic human speech, capable of calling people by their name. It does so at night, to lure unsuspecting victims away to be devoured. It is also impervious to weapons of steel. A couple of centuries later, Penny also wrote of it in his Natural History, with similar brevity. He also calls it a wolf-dog hybrid, and mentions how it can crush anything with its teeth. Crocottas apparently swallow their softened prey whole. Pliny also declared the Crocotta to be the offspring of a hyena and an Ethiopian lioness, and expanded quite a bit on their appearance in the same section. These beasts can mimic human voices, have excellent eyesight, and with a single tooth in each jaw. However, these teeth are far from ordinary fangs. They are a single bone blade and lack any gum around them. The sharpness of these blades is protected by some part of the animal, which Pliny likens to a sheath. Quite the unique features. While the majority of early accounts come from travelers, it seems a few specimens had found their way onto the continent, with a little help. Emperor Septimus Severus imported some crocottas to Rome. Cassius Dio, a contemporary historian, saw it with his own eyes, describing it as a creature with the general features of a lioness and a tiger, with a curious blend of dog and fox sprinkled on top. No mention of the language when making abilities, though. We have to look for a different source for reinforcement on that one. Poor Fury of Tyre comes to our rescue with On Abstinence from Animal Food contemplating from a more philosophical angle. Besides casually linking the crocotta to the hyena, we'll get back to that, he also laments how these beasts can speak local languages fluently without a teacher. They call people they know they can vanquish, even mimicking the voice of those they find dear, or whose code they are more likely to heed. Struggling with an archaic perception of humans' place within the animal kingdom, as well as a completely made-up phenomenon, he seems confused about how and why this would be possible, but does not mention anything else about the beast. Enter Alien and his book titled On the Characteristics of Animals, where he discloses far more interesting tidbits about the weird creature, besides fully equating them with hyenas. He begins by stating that the animals change their sex yearly, which is obviously not true in real life. It is a relatively well-known fact that spotted hyena females have a pseudo-penis, something that the unseasoned eye may not be able to fully distinguish from a regular male one. Thus, early scholars considering them hermaphroditic is not a surprise, even if them changing sexes is a bit of a falsehood. 
Hyenas are also apparently able to stop hounds from barking. They do so by creeping up on the target pupper on the night of a full moon and cast their shadow over the animal. This act bewitches them, making them completely silent and obedient. And this is not even the only seemingly magical ability the Crocotta can wield. Their left paws are sleep inducing, casting a deep torpor on anything through direct contact. Apparently, the beasts sneak into stables, and if they find any animal already asleep, they place their curious bow on the nose of their prey and suffocate them. I'm uh, not exactly convinced there is magic involved there, but sure, the rest of the story does not make it any more plausible. It continues by the hyena digging a hole beneath the head of the carcass to better expose the neck, facilitating a strong bite with which they can carry the meal to safety. You can already see how fantastical elements seep into these accounts, regardless of whether we are talking about the real or made up animal. Still, there is more. Right after mentioning the Crocotta as an Indian name for the hyena, Alien tells how the beasts imitate human vomiting to attract dogs. Generally, this tactic is used to munch on them. But I'd assume it is just as effective when they aim to make thralls out of the disgusting little furballs. In a similar fashion, they learn the names of woodcutters by listening to their speech, then call them into the woods. Moving a bit further with every call, they isolate the lumberjacks and devour them. A somewhat familiar story. Also, I just found out reading Aliens Bits and the Hyena that there are sea hyenas or hyena fish too. Probably an extremely obscure thing, as I couldn't even find an image of them, but still munition for a potential future episode. Now that we have official confirmation that crocodiles are at the very least a species of hyena, let's take a U-turn and see what Pliny said about those. Well, even though he mentions this as a refuted fact, apparently many believed that the animals changed sexes annually and were capable of parthenogenesis. Interesting. They can also mimic human speech, luring their victims to their death by learning their names. Hmm, they also imitate a man vomiting to attract dogs and can silence the animals using their shadow. There are also a few excerpted bits, corruptions of which later B-series do attribute to the Crocotta, despite Pliny distinguishing it from hyenas. These include the fact that they apparently can't bend their neck, as it, with the mane, runs continuously into the backbone. Yes, uh, last I checked all necks connect to the spine, in fact they are part of it, but I digress. It apparently stops the animals from turning their head. Additionally, hyenas can also circle other animals three times, which makes those immovable. This ability is specified to be a magical one. Hyenas are also declared to be the only animals to dig up graves in search of the dead, which they devour for sustenance. Lastly, while females are rarely caught, which is kind of weird due to the whole sex changing thing, but their eyes are reported to be a thousand different colors and shades. Yes, like a kaleidoscope. Other barely notable sources include Strabo's Geographica, which calls the Crocotta the hybrid of a wolf and a dog, but writes nothing else of interest. As you can see, while most sources touch on a couple matching features, most of them add a bit of a twist, and as we edge further and further into the Middle Ages, we see more and more elements take a new turn. Instead of a stiff neck, it turns out that it is the eyes of the crocotta that do not swivel in their sockets, which is the reason it has to turn its entire head to look in a direction. Additionally, the eyes themselves hold within them, or in some cases are, minerals, special gemstones that grant vision of the future when placed under a tongue. Isidore of Seville was one of the first people to note this latter part, possibly unaware of the fact of how large an eyeball of a creature of that size would be. Bartholomew the Englishman in De Proprietatibus Rerum writes that hyenas have the neck of an adder and the reach of an elephant, which is the reason they cannot bend their neck. Man, this misconception is so odd and so widespread, I guess hyenas just have that weird stature for the unseasoned eye. Either way, we still have yet to talk about the Lucrata. The two creatures are nowadays treated as practically the same, and there is truth to that. Both of them are misinterpretations of hyenas, but there are a few distinctions which set them apart. 
First off, Pliny gave a much more detailed description of the Lucretta. He said it is a wide beast of extraordinary swiftness and the size of a wide ass. It walks on the legs of a stag with cloven hooves on each foot, a feature strongly emphasized in many depictions. It has the neck, tail and breast of a lion, with a badger's head sitting on top. Additionally, the mouth is extremely wide, slit from ear to ear, hiding a continuous blade of bone instead of teeth. It can also mimic human voice, just like its counterpart. The ungulate features are not mentioned in descriptions specifically describing the crocotta, and neither is this a wolf dog hybrid, but the rest of the account is rather familiar. Most medieval notes on the Lucretta are very similar, with the exception of switching stag legs for leonine ones, albeit this is hardly reflected in most depictions. There is a common mix-up with progeny as well, stating that crocottas and lions mating produce the Lucretta, or as they spell it, Leucretta. There is one last edition of note from medieval series that touches on one of the animals of this trio, one that is, uh, well, it's a religious moralization of the hyena. They are hermaphroditic, constantly change their sex and eat corpses. They were bound to be frowned upon by the very enlightened and highly tolerant philosophers of the era. The hyena was likened to people who at first serve God, but give themselves to earthly pleasures and idolatry, as those who abandon themselves to vice are akin to repugnant beasts. It's the Jews, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Jews, grossly insulting both a family of animals and a religion with a stroke of a pen. They took the misunderstood and exaggerated version of the former and applied all of its negative features to the latter, drawing non-existent parallels in their pursuit of truth, I guess. Stepping over this literary third I included for the sake of thoroughness, let's return to the links between crocottas, lucrottas and hyenas. I've already mentioned how numerous sources, some going back as far as 200 AD, fully equate crocottas with hyenas. It may very well be the case that the two mythical creatures are but species of the hyenidae family, ones we cannot fully identify. Why the spotted hyena received the Crocuta Crocuta Latin name? It is simply the result of the legends and is not necessarily an accurate representation of the lore. Additionally, the Crocotta and Lucrotta are both mentioned as either Indian or Ethiopian animals, and while both regions have their own hyena species, the spotted hyena is fully African. Striped hyenas, on the other hand, have quite a range and can be found at both locales. Brown hyenas are an excellent candidate to be misidentified as dog-wolf hybrids concerning their looks, but they live at the southernmost regions of Africa, meaning that encounters were very unlikely for a long time. Lastly, the art wolf is too small to be the beast discussed in these legends, even if their habitat would be a match in some places. It is a likely prospect that both a striped and spotted species were included in these accounts, and it is a distinct possibility that they each correlated with one of the two names initially. At this point, it is practically impossible to determine which was which, especially since other animals, like the African white dog, might have also been misidentified as part of this group. This is further highlighted by the fact that Pliny mentioned crocottas, lucrottas and hyenas in his work, meaning three distinct animals at the least. This is not helped by the fact that features were mixed together seemingly at random, with very few characteristics remaining linked to only one variant. Characteristics that often do not make sense, like the cloven hooves. Either way, there are some features we can clearly attribute to one of the real animals. I've already mentioned the sex changing and how it's related to the unique biology of spotted hyenas. The launine neck and badger face are possibly an attempt to describe striped hyenas and their prominent mane. Told tales of how the creatures cannot bend their neck might be a simple illusion caused by the distinct stature of hyenas. Their bodies are taller at the front legs and their backs slope downwards toward the hindquarters. The unusual posture paired with their thick neck may lead one to believe they need to move most of their body to look around. This is simply my thought experiment though, as there seems to be nothing as this rather prominent characteristic could be based on. The human speech is a rather obvious one. Hyena laughter is famously human-like. Even though it is technically not laughter, 
both spotted and striped hyenas can produce said sound, albeit spotted hyenas are not only a lot more vocal, but they have a wider range as well. Striped hyenas, both due to their silent nature and having but a single vaguely human distress call, are not great candidates for being confused as speaking a language, but spotted ones fit like a glove. Now they do not actually use these sounds to lure people, and no one is stupid enough to run headfirst towards a distressed hyena, so those additions are embellishments for sure. These animals do occasionally dig up corpses, so that is also a check, and can be quite the vicious opponents. Spotted hyenas especially are rather dangerous, so exaggerations of their speed, ferocity and imperviousness to weapons of metal might be attributed to their fearsome reputation. The bone blade is a rather hard sell though, it is quite obvious that hyenas of all species have regular teeth, and even at a distance those canines are quite distinct, and the whole thing is rather diverse. One theory is that the guillotine-like jaws might be a result of observers catching sight of hyenas carrying away bones from a carcass. The perverted lack of gum may reinforce this notion, while the bits of skin and flesh still remaining on the snack could have inspired a statement about the sheath protecting these unique teeth. Still, it is not a surprise that this characteristic is not a constant one. Numerous depictions show regular dentures, and many sources do not even mention the blades. The cloven hooves are a similarly odd body part. Hyena legs are quite clearly not equipped with anything akin to a hoof, let alone a cloven one. If you catch sight of the feet, you can make out the toes even at a distance. The only thing I can think of is that their stature is reminiscent of giraffes. Another poorly understood creature of pastoras, but one with actual coven hooves. Perhaps there was a mix-up, or assumptions were made, so this might be enough of a reason, but it is flimsy justification. I got nothing better though. I think I've addressed the prominent similarities and differences, and probably won't need to go over whether or not hyenas can cast spells or have torpor poles. Therefore, we only have one thing left to do. Theorize a hypothetical creature that could fit the legends of the Crocot and Lucretta even better, a product of speculative evolution, inhabiting an imaginary version of Earth. What sort of creature would that be? Well, the two most restrictive characteristics are the cloven hooves and the bone blade. The canine features are not exactly a constant, and if I've learned anything over the course of this series, it's that anything is a dog if you look hard enough. However, it being a predator is an important attribute, so we should keep that in mind. Now, if you've seen my Water Jaguar video, or know anything about the Mesonychia Order, you might be thinking you've already got this one figured out. Well, not exactly. Cloven hooves are a far cry from anything we have fossil evidence of. These animals had four hooved fingers, and would hardly resemble our quote-unquote picture evidence. We need to look at a different group, and if you think I've dodged retreading familiar ground, well, let me disappoint you. That's right, we are making another antelodont. Wait, hold on, don't click away, it's gonna be quite distinct, I promise. So, we know for a fact that the antelodon, Eo antelodon, Parantelodon and Proantelodon genera did inhabit what is now Eurasia. Therefore, one or more relatives of these animals making their way to India and Ethiopia over the coming couple millions of years is a reasonable assumption. But what would set it apart from the rest? What would ensure its survival? Well, it would be smaller, for a start. Our best guess as to the reason behind why Entelodons did not make it is the climate change of the Oligocene and Miocene, which caused massive changes in habitats, available plants, and potential prey. As far as we know, these animals were omnivorous, consuming roots, nuts, fruits, as well as meat, mostly in the form of carcasses. Transitioning from a tropical forest to open grasslands was almost certainly hard on these animals, as they could not utilize the fibrous grasses as well as other herbivores, and were more than likely outcompeted for speed by the potential prey animals due to their short legs. However, our preliminary crocotta managed to stay in the race, thanks to two adaptations. As I've said, they are smaller, roughly the size of a hyena, for obvious reasons, meaning they need a fraction of the sustenance the other hawking terror pigs would require. Additionally, they are much more focused on scavenging carcasses, and thus only a small portion of their diet was affected. Their bone-crunching lifestyle is further aided by the changes in their teeth, which form almost homogeneous, heavily ridged rows with a singular purpose. Break bones into smaller, swallowable pieces. 
much like hyenas, they consume every bit of a body, using their powerful jaws to cut sinew and hide alike. The build of the Entheldont is almost purpose-made for strong bites, carrying a massive head with thick muscles that open and close their maw. While resembling a single piece, the teeth simply fit close together and are not actually connected, as that is not a smart design. First off, how does that even grow and develop? Secondly, if it is one piece, it is enough for it to break at one segment, and the entirety of the pulp, as well as all nerve endings and blood vessels, suddenly get exposed to the harsh external environment, causing the complete thing to just die not long after. Anyway, since the point of these teeth is not really to firmly lock onto something, but to cut and break, such a design is actually rather beneficial. Additionally, it might just be the right thing against competitors. Other animals that might want to contest the carcass need to be very wary. Crocodiles do not bite quite the same way as other animals. Instead of going for fleshy bits to try and cause pain or lacerations that would dissuade unwanted guests at the table, they go for the legs, their heavy maws point downwards, snatching at the parts with the least protection on the bones. If they manage to grab the shin of an opposing scavenger, a crippling squeeze shattering the limb is almost guaranteed to be a death sentence. Even other entheldons might learn to avoid their smaller relatives, as they would be far more vulnerable to the specialized implements than the crocodiles are to them snapping at their backs from above. Additionally, their relatively short, very thick necks paired with the heavy head might mean they actually do have trouble looking to the sides beyond a certain point, preferring instead to turn with their body. Not a huge disability by any stretch of the imagination, but one that is rather lower accurate. These changes not only account for the more problematic features, but also cement the as of yet unfinished crocodiles as quite the competitive animals, ones that could certainly survive to the modern day, or the Middle Ages at the very least. If we expand on their rough, make it prominent, and give them a bit of a lesser version of a Leonine main, that would also tick another characteristic of the list. It may either serve as a display of good genetics during mating, or give them a bit more neck protection in their bloody fight against other scavengers and predators. Perhaps both? We need to modify the tail a bit too. It is not unreasonable to think that a longer tail, more fit to swatting insects and other parasites, might be a good addition. It is a development that is not detrimental at any rate as the linked increase in upkeep is minimal. What about human speech though? That is bound to be an exaggeration, obviously, as there is no way our entheldons would develop sapiens and learn human speech naturally. Their lifestyle does not require such a high level of brain capacity, and they receive no stimuli strong enough for that to even develop. However, that is not to say they could not be smarter than their now extinct relatives. They might be, if their loud communication is anything to go by. Truth be told, we don't really have a clear picture of what Entheldons could have sounded like, and we can only guess based on similar animals that live today. That being said, a wider range of vocal cues can, for example, be used to deepen interspecies social relations and interactions, to mark territory and scare of competition, or to aid in courting. Since our crocodiles are likely to have transitioned to living in tightly knit families, offering more protection from larger predators as well as helping secure carcasses more easily, increased vocalization is a logical next step. Now, do not imagine larger clans of these beasts trotting about. The families would not consist of more than a couple individuals, as they are still foragers and scavengers. They are not hunters, therefore larger groups would not result in more food, simply smaller portions. Still, helping them stay close to each other and providing effective signals for potential dangers, a varied scale of calls is definitely a boon. We could extrapolate these sounds to be vaguely humanoid in nature, much like hyena distress signals. Even a slight resemblance would give rise to a tidal wave of fantastical stories, detailing how these blade teeth monsters lure men to their doom. In reality, even if someone would be foolish enough to approach these creepy sounds, Crocodiles would likely not engage them. They are not predators, after all, and humans have a nasty nature of being more dangerous than they appear. On a rather similar note, crocodiles occasionally vomiting food do foul even for them, and some dagos being drawn to defeat its smell is not an unlikely scenario either. 
not so much as imitating the sound of throwing up, but rather practicing the act itself, it is still close enough for me. This would be the last notable feature to include from the original lore. They would not make it with lions, their eyes are not gemstones that grant an impossible power, they do not actually know magic. No chloroform left paws either, and bewitching animals by circling them is similarly a no-go. We could say dogs fall silent when they see a crocodile out of fear, but that would only occur on a per dog basis. He did barking is just as likely, so that one's just an odd tale. People managed to add these features to something as unsupernatural as hyenas, after all. I'm actually immensely surprised that unsupernatural is a real word, by the way. This is it for the crocotta, and consequently this episode. A terror pig turned... well, it's still a terror pig, just easier on the eyes. Hope you enjoyed the past 20 minutes or so, these beasts were sure a challenge to make heads and tails of. If you fancy speculative evolution and monsters, or just plain world building, come join my Discord server. You can also support the channel on Patreon if you'd like, relevant links down in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll let you go now. Hope to see you next time. Bye!